Hi, and welcome to chapter three. Uh, chapter three is an extension of chapter two. In chapter two, we learned the concepts, the cost flows and everything of job order costing. In chapter three, we're gonna be introduced to the, yeah, the accounting side, the journal entries, the ledger accounts, the flow in that sense. So let's jump in and take a look. Learning objective number one, understand the flow of costs in the job order costing system through journal entries and T accounts. So objective one and two are kind of melded together. So we're looking overall at flow of costs. Remember our three basic costs for manufacturing, raw materials, direct labor, manufacturing overhead. <clears throat> Excuse me. And we have our period costs as well, which is everything other than this. Now on the balance sheet, we've got three inventory accounts. Raw materials, work in process, and finished goods. And remember, work in process is the place where we're kind of, it's kind of a bucket where we're dumping all our costs in to accumulate them for the project that we're working on. And that's why you see raw materials from the raw materials inventory. We get requ requisitioned materials that go into work and process. And then we have direct labor manufacturing overhead that also go in there. When the job is complete, the costs associated with the completed product or project are moved from work in process to finished goods. And they're called the cost of goods manufactured. Makes sense. So we now have a finished goods inventory. And you'll remember from chapter four, our discussion on in financial accounting on, uh, on merchandising companies, that when you sell inventory, it moves from the balance sheet inventory account into cost of goods sold on the income statement. All right, to illustrate the cost flows within a job order costing system, we will look at Ruger Corporation's transactions for the month of April. Ruger produces commemorative medallions and only had two jobs in April. Job A was a special minting of a thousand gold medallions commemorating the invention of motion pictures. Was started during March and completed in April. So what that tells us is that there were costs associated with job A, and even though it wasn't completed, those costs remained in work in process, and they were carried over from March to April when hopefully the project will be done. The job A had been assigned $30,000 in manufacturing costs, so that's what the ba ending balance and beginning balance of work in process are. Job B was in order for 10,000 silver medallions commemorating the fall of the Berlin Wall. It was started in April, but was incomplete at the end of the month. So job B is going to be in the same position as job A was in March. We're going to have costs associated to job B that are in work in process, but those will carry over until May, until when the job will probably be completed. All right, so here is, here is our discussion for raw materials. Raw materials are purchased, so there's a debit to raw materials and a credit to either um, accounts payable or cash, if you're paying cash for your raw materials. Then when the project starts, there's a requisition for raw materials. Obviously, you can't make anything without something to start with. So we have some direct materials, some direct materials from here, and those costs are going to be credited to raw materials and debited to work in process. We have our first product cost associated with. The indirect materials, right? Remember, the materials that aren't directly traceable to the product are called indirect. They go to manufacturing overhead. So we're going to credit raw materials and debit manufacturing overhead for those indirect materials. Next is direct labor. Again, direct labor that goes to the product or project 
will be a credit to uh, work salaries and wages payable or and a debit to work in process. So we have two of our three product costs in WIP. The indirect labor, again, not directly traceable to the product, will be a debit to manufacturing overhead. We're then throwing in some other overhead costs. Again, debit to manufacturing overhead. I know, throwing in. I don't know where they get it from, it's just there. Now, remember we talked about the predetermined overhead rate in chapter two and how to calculate the manufacturing overhead. We call that overhead applied because that's the guess, right? That's our best guess because we don't have all of the manufacturing overhead costs when we take on a project from a client, but we need to have all of our costs to calculate a price, right? We have to know what to charge the customer. So we estimate or apply manufacturing overhead using the POHR formula. So now that we have all of our costs in work and process, we're ready to rock and roll. Here are our non-manufacturing costs. Remember, non-manufacturing is not non-product related. So we have selling and admin. We have selling and admin salary costs. That's a debit to salaries expense, credit to salary and wages payable. Now, be careful on these problems when you're reading about depreciation and things, because they're going to talk about depreciation on office equipment and depreciation on factory equipment. Those are two different things. Depreciation on office equipment is a non-manufacturing cost, so that gets a debit to depreciation expense and a credit to accumulated depreciation. Depreciation on factory equipment is going to be a manufacturing overhead cost, so it's going in a different place. We have advertising and selling admin expenses here in our third entry. So we debit advertising expense for $42,000. We credit, we debit other selling and administrative expense for eight. And we credit accounts payable for the total of $50,000. Now, if you pay those expenses with cash, obviously that credit would be to cash, not to accounts payable because it's not being accrued. And we all remember what the word accrued means, right? Okay, so now we have a product it's complete. We've got all of our costs. We're now going to take those costs. We're going to call them cost of goods manufactured. We're going to credit work and process for the costs, and we're going to move them over in a debit to, to finished goods. And there'll be cost of goods manufactured and their finished goods inventory. They're ready for sale. And you'll remember from 201, that when we actually sell inventory, the cost goes from cost of goods manufactured to cost of goods sold, right? And COGS, we've worked with COGS a lot. And that's a credit to finished goods and a debit to COGS. And remember, this is now moving from finished goods on the balance sheet to cost of goods sold on the income statement. So as good accountants, we have to do some schedules. We have to make sure that we've got all the costs aligned. And for that, we're going to use a couple of different reports. We're going to have a schedule of cost of goods manufactured and cost of goods sold. The schedules contain the three manufacturing costs, direct materials, direct labor, manufacturing overhead. And they're going to calculate the cost of raw material and direct labor used in, in production and the amount of manufacturing overhead applied. Remember the, the credit to manufacturing overhead. The manufacturing overhead costs associated with goods that were finished during the period. So we start, we have three columns here. First thing we need to do is figure out how much raw materials did we actually use. And the way we do that is we take the beginning raw materials inventory we add to that the raw materials that we purchased in the period. That gives us the total raw materials that were available for production in the period. In this case, it would be the month of April. 
and we're going to subtract from that the ending balance in the raw materials inventory. If I take everything I had and subtract what I have left, the difference is what I used for the period. So that gives us raw materials used in production. That's going to come up here under manufacturing costs. We're then going to add direct labor, add the manufacturing overhead applied, and that gives us total manufacturing costs for the period. Now remember, the thing is we're, track, we're trying to do is we're trying to figure out the cost of goods manufactured. Well, we're going to start with the beginning work in process inventory. Remember I said in the beginning that product A, I think it was, wasn't completed at the end of March. Right? So everything that went into product A in March was carried over as beginning work in process inventory for April. We're going to add to that the total manufacturing costs that we had for April, and that gives us the total work in process that we had for the period. Again, if we subtract from the total work in process we had available, the ending balance in work in process, the difference is our cost of goods manufactured for April. So we've now calculated what that number is. That number is going to come up here under finished goods. We're going to add the finished goods beginning inventory. That's the stuff that wasn't sold that was produced last period. We add those costs to the cost of goods manufactured for this period. And then we have the total cost of goods available for sale. We're subtracting from that the ending finished goods inventory will give us COGS. And again, you might remember that we use this calculation in, uh, in the merchandising chapter from financial accounting. All right, so now we're going to take up what we talked about before. The difference between the overhead cost applied to work in process, which is a credit, and the actual overhead cost for the period, which is a debit. All right, so we're going to have a credit and a debit to work in process, and we're going to have either a debit balance or a credit balance. It's going to be rare that, there, that there's no difference. So if we have a debit balance in manufacturing overhead, that means the amount of overhead applied to the jobs during the period using POHR was less than the actual. So what does that say? Our guess was off. We guessed less than the actual costs. On the other side of the coin, if we have a credit balance, that means we over-applied manufacturing overhead, meaning that we applied more than the actual costs became. In either case, we need to handle that situation because we need to get rid of the balance in manufacturing overhead. So our example here is Perco. Perco had actual overhead for the year of $650,000. They had 170,000 direct labor hours worked, and they use a POHR of four bucks per direct labor hour. So if we multiply that $4 times 170,000 direct labor hours, we get $680,000. That's the applied manufacturing overhead. However, their actual was only 650. So we oh, they overapplied overhead by $30,000. And the question is, as it says here, what will they do? What do you do with that overapplication of manufacturing overhead? And at this point, I want to I want to point out to you, remember, when we talk about overapplied overhead, that means that we put more cost into the product than it actually had. And we use that cost to calculate the price. So any remaining balance in manufacturing overhead must be cleared out. We have to zero it. And it can be zeroed out in one of two ways. Either we dump it all into cost of goods sold. Yeah, that's the easy way. Or we proportionally allocate it to the accounts where it should be, meaning some into work and process, 
some into finished goods, and some into cost of goods sold. So if we're going to use the easy way, right? Remember, over applied means we put more overhead in than we should. So we have a credit balance here. So we're going to debit this account to zero it out, and we're going to credit cost of goods sold. So take 10 seconds and think about what crediting cost of goods sold does. One, two, three. Okay, so a credit, remember, cost of goods sold has a normal debit balance. If we credit it, we're reducing it. If we reduce cost of goods sold, what does that do on the income statement? Well, sales minus cost of goods sold is the gross margin, remember. Well, if we reduce COGS, we're increasing the gross margin. If we increase the gross margin, we're increasing net income. So that's what this is doing. If we have an over application, we're going to be increasing net income to reduce for the, uh, the amount of expenses that we put in that shouldn't have been there. Calculating the allocation of underapplied, overapplied, it's a little different issue. So we're assuming here that we have balances in each of the accounts. The balance in work and process is 68,000. The balance in finished goods is 204, and the balance in COGS is 408. We're going to add them up to get a total of $680,000. Now we can go in and do a little work, get a ratio. The ratio of ending work, ending work in process to the total is 10%. The ratio of ending finished goods inventory is 30%. And for COGS, it's 60. So we now have ratios that we can use to allocate that $30,000 that we need. So 10% of for work in process is going to get $3,000. Finished goods is going to get $9,000. And COGS is going to get 18. Right? 10 times 30, 30% times 30, 60% times 30. So we've now allocated that $30,000, which gives us a much more accurate allocation of that over application. So we're going to debit manufacturing overhead for thirty dollars That zeroes it out. And we're going to credit work in process, finished goods, and cost of goods sold. And remember, these are all inventories. Therefore, they are assets. Therefore, their normal balance is a credit is a debit rather. So crediting them reduces each one of them. So in summary, so we got two methods. You have the easy method, dump it into COGS. You have the somewhat more challenging method of allocating to work in process, finished goods, and cost of goods sold. And that's it for chapter three. And I've, uh, I had actually a, <laughs> I got a call from a student yesterday about homework. I was on the way home from my daughter's house in my car, and I helped this gentleman find the answer to, uh, to the homework problem while we were talking in the car. So I am always available to you guys. If you need help, please don't hesitate to call. I do Zoom meetings. I do face-to-face -face in my office on Tuesdays and Thursdays. If you want that, you just have to contact me and let me know that you need some help. That being said, have a great week.